The devil is a professional Jesus loser. Is the you are anointed to win. Jesus is the Welcome to the Walk the Devil podcast. Jesus is Here's the your host, Corey Scarlett. Jesus What's going on, everybody? Jesus Welcome to the Whoop the Devil podcast. Getting started right now. Glad you're tuning in. It's 8 o'clock. It's Thursday. It's a great day to be alive. Glad you're on. Uh, we are going to be reading. If you want to go ahead and get your Bibles out, you want to get ready for the study. Uh, 2 John, not John chapter 2, not 1 John chapter 2. But Second John, and it's on page uh, 476 of my Bible. I don't know about yours, but uh, you can look in the, in the table of contents. So hope you're having an awesome day. If you would, if you have any of these platforms right here, I want you to follow. So there's a page. I know this is streaming from my personal page because it always does better numbers. However, there is a page, Whoop the Devil Podcast on Facebook. Watch that. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. If you have a YouTube account, I need, I'm trying to get that subscriber count up. Please go on there and follow. Um, Instagram, I'll, I'm going to start posting some reels on Instagram and Twitter. Or not Twitter, but TikTok. It's not where I'm, I'm on TikTok. If you've got a TikTok account, follow that. Uh, check out the Etsy shop. Follow on Twitter or actually X, formerly known as Twitter, follow on, if you have Spotify, the podcast is on there, and the podcast is supposed to be on Apple. Now, I got I to gotta check that again, because I checked, and it wasn't, and I uploaded it. Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I'm supposed to pay some money. I, it looked like it was free. Maybe it takes a, a, a little while to get on there. Nope, I don't see it. When I type in whoop, whoop the Devil on Apple Podcast, it uh, has some weird stuff. So, we're <laughs> anyways, um, but follow if you would. I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, share this if you have somebody that needs, you know, we're just reading the Bible simply. It's called the Whoop the Devil Podcast because the Bible is our sword of the spirit. It is our weapon. How did Jesus send the devil packing when he was fasting in the wilderness? He quoted the word. And even when the devil tried to twist the scripture, he knew the scripture. So that's what we're doing. We're studying the word uh, through this fast. Most of y'all uh, or most Christians are on a 21 day fast or either they finished that up recently. I just I felt to go this first month and podcast every day or at least during the fast. So we've been through, we're coming to the end of it, but we've been through uh, James, a chapter, every chapter in James. You can go back and watch them. Uh, we've been through First Peter, Second Peter, First John, and now Second John, and then Third John tomorrow during lunch we'll be doing that. And if you if you you if you're busy during lunch, go back and watch it. All right. And, um, but we will be doing one tomorrow, finishing up. Now, let's get into it. Second John has some interesting stuff. It also reiterates a lot of things that John, we've been reading John talking about. So, let's get right into it. I have the New Living Translation and the New American Standard Bible. I have a Dakes New King James Version Study Bible. So, um... We'll go through those. And I have something interesting I want to take some extra time to uh, go through. This letter is from John the Elder. Now, something you need to understand about John. John was the oldest. He's believed to be the oldest of the 12 disciples. He was the oldest disciple. So you can write this in the comments. John was the oldest disciple. John was the oldest disciple, or, you know, you could say apostle, but he was the oldest of the 12 disciples, the oldest of the 12 apostles, however you want to write it. I'll let you choose. But how was he an elder? This study Bible has something interesting. He was an elder in three ways. By title, being, a, you know, by being an apostle and, and a preaching elder, 
which is the the Greek word presbyteros, which is found in Acts 14.23, which I, I want to see that real quick. So he was one of the elders in the church. Now, you know, sometimes people still use the term elder. Some people use the term deacon. Uh, some, you know, even sometimes interchangeably, they've used the word pastor or overseer. Um, in the English translations, but uh, it says in Acts 14, uh, 23, it said they had appointed elders in every church. So each church had an elder or had el multiple elders. This was, uh, here's, here's a little bit on the word that they use for elders. Uh, the word elders in the Old Testament meant the heads or, or rulers of the tribes, cities, and nations. In the Gospels and in Acts, it generally refers to the Sanhedrin, all right, who weren't always good people towards Jesus. Actually, they were really bad towards Jesus. But in the early church, elders were the ministers, and that's where we're at now in this timeline. They were the ministers and deacons or, or preaching elders and business elders of the local church. So you had those that ministered, those that helped handle the business of the church, that's what that's talking about, okay? Um, apostles were elders, but all elders were not apostles, all right? So they were elders in the church, but not all elders were apostles. The elders of Acts 20, 17 were the overseers, okay? Um, it says in 1 Timothy and in Titus, it talks about elders. And 1 Peter 5, it talks about elders who were preaching elders or bishops. Now, a bishop would oversee multiple churches okay business elders were deacons and that's in acts chapter six and, and bishops and deacons are mentioned in and it mentions a bunch of different uh, scriptures it's also used to refer to older men and women in the church uh and it also talks about in revelation you've heard maybe you've heard that revert the elders referred to in revelation and that's talking about heavenly ranks so Anyways, thought that was interesting. Uh, so John is an, is he said this is a letter from John the Elder. I am writing to the chosen lady and to her children, whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth. Now, who is he talking about? There's differing opinions on who he was writing this to, but he was writing it to a woman who had uh, some children. That's the the most we know about it. And I'll read you a couple different things. Because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. But whoever this person was, they were important to the body of Christ for John to write this letter. Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. This is his greeting, right? That he greets people with grace, mercy, and peace. He's just speaking of the goodness of God, okay? Um, a biblical greeting, all right? Some people, they don't greet like this. They greet in, uh, um, I'm trying to figure out a nice word to say. You'll see people in church. They just look like they're just like, they they don't know how to greet with with grace, mercy, and peace. They greet with stress and blah, and they just like, they're miserable to be around. Don't be that Christian. Don't be that Christian. Be the one that says grace, mercy, and peace. Be that guy. Be that lady. Okay, let me keep going. Um, I want to read you a couple things. Who is this woman John's talking to? Let's find out. So I'm going to come back to the scripture in a second. I'll leave that up. But uh, so Greek, that Greek word for lady there, it says it is kuria. K-U-R-I-A. And it says, therefore, it may signify lady. Okay, wait, hold on. It's the feminine of cur curios, which means Lord. Therefore, it may signify lady or some most, and it has lady with a capital L, or some most excellent and honorable woman to whom John addressed the epistle, address, addressed the letter, right? She likely had a church in her home. Now, this is what Dake's notes say. I'm going to read you some other notes because some people think it was someone different, but they believe, he believes she had a, a, 
likely had a church in her home, okay, uh, in the early church. She was a married woman, for her children are also saluted. No husband is mentioned, so perhaps she was a widow who entertained many ministers and traveling evangelists in her home. So maybe she facilitated ministry through her home. Um, because the, the children were honored, uh, we, they, they believe culturally that would signify she was married. She could have be a, a widow currently because he doesn't mention the husband. Um, now there's a couple articles I found. I, I just want to reference real quick. So godquestions.com, which has some pretty good stuff most of the time. They are trying to explain who is um, the elect lady and her children. So it said their their uh, things that, that their article says. Excuse me, I don't know. I'm tripping over my words right now. Um, let's see. The lady of John two is called the elect, not because she was Jewish. Because sometimes that is used, um, if you see the word elect, a lot of times it's used to refer to um, the Jewish people. We don't know her ethnic background. But because she was part of the church, the universal church is comprised of all people who believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior who died on the cross to bear the guilt and pay the penalty of their, of their sin and who conquered death at his resurrection. The universal church came into, okay, so it talks about the church. I'm trying to find, tell me who the lady is. All right. John calls the lady in 2 John the elect because she believed in Jesus Christ and was therefore saved. She was a member of the universal church. Okay, they're explaining, uh, is, was she a, uh, a Jew because she, she was referenced as the elect? Some interpreters see the lady not as an individual, but as a symbol of the church as a whole or of the local body of believers. But that interpretation makes it difficult to explain who her children are. It is better to view this lady as an unnamed friend of John who had actual children who were serving the Lord. And there's actually two elect ladies mentioned because at the end of the chapter, you'll see it mentions her sister. So this the, right here, they believe it kind of goes in line with what the date notes say. Now, I saw another article that was saying from the Bible history guy. I don't know who the Bible history guy is. I don't know if he's legit. But he claims that uh, they were talking about Mary. However, Mary would have been pretty old because I, I believe John was super, was like in his 90s when this thing was written. Maybe, what? It said it was written in Ephesus about AD 90. He would have been very old. So I don't, I'm having a hard time with that one. But... Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not going to read that. He's talking to a lady. We'll put it that way. He's talking to a lady, a good Christian lady. Nothing going on here. John, nothing wrong going on here. Like John's trying to holler at this lady. Okay. He's commending this lady and we know she's a blessing to the church. That's all. That's basically what, what we know. All right. Here's what he tells her, and it applies to us. This is not just in context. He was talking to one lady. No, th this is the thing about the Bible. Understand in context, we can all we can all take. You read things in context, but it's written. It's a personal letter from God to you. Okay, the Bible speaks to 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 uh, to everybody that reads it. So you can take things from this. It's not just for that one lady. And it gets on my nerves because people. People will, will will pull the context card in scripture all the time when they when they don't want it to apply to them, and it's it's ridiculous. But um, all right, let me keep going. I, I'm I'm on a strange rant. Okay, uh, how happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. All right, so John was happy to see these guys, these young people. Um, Maybe people he ministered to when they were when they were kids, and then they were grown, and it just brought joy. Um, you know, let me let me. I I want you to write something in the comments, but I'm trying to figure out how to say it. There is an uns 
let's see. There is an uncomparable joy to seeing someone that you invested in, that you discipled, grow up and be, especially when it comes to children, see them mature in the faith. Um, write this in the comments, right? There is a special joy in seeing children grow up serving God. There is a special joy in seeing children grow up to serve God. Now, maybe there's people on here, you've had your children do the same thing. There's nothing like it. You just, I mean, for me as a youth pastor, you know, there's certain kids that I was like, man, I don't know if they're getting what I'm saying, like from years ago. And then they're adults now. And I'm like, wow, you know, they're doing well, you know, um, there's ones here in Clewiston. There's ones that, that, I, um, you know, I'm sure you parents, like, you know, I see Jessica on here, got some great girls there. She's doing a great job. And I, and I know every time you see them serving in the house of God with joy and, and doing what you've taught them, there's a joy to that, that you can't explain and can't compare. I know hearing things that my daughter says, I'm like, wow, I try to, I have a hard time sometimes not to like just tear up every time I hear it. So I'm like a, there's, I'm a big softy, you know, you guys might not know that, but when it comes to, uh, especially my daughter, I'm a big softy. All right. So sometimes I try not to, uh, I try to <laughs> I try real hard not to like tear up every time something like that happens, but there's a joy and, and it's, it's awesome. I can tell you right now, just from like, not even my own children, but, um, from a, a person I invested in when they were a kid and you see them grow up and they're, they're doing the, th the things of God. It's awesome. So, um, um, so number verse number five, let's keep going. I'm writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. Again, he's reminding this y'all better be loving each other. You've seen the last book, uh, that he wrote the last letter he wrote first John that was a lot about loving each other this is not a new commandment actually let's do it just because John repeated it I want you to repeat it in the comments we must love one another we must love one another this is not a new commandment but one we have had from the beginning yeah you can see it even in the Old Testament in the is throughout the Ten Commandments. I mentioned this uh, a couple of podcasts ago. I mentioned it again. The first four commandments deal with loving God. The next six deal with loving your fellow man. Love not your not dealing with yourself, but how do you treat others? Loving uh, it says honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. And all those have to deal with not you and not even directly to God, though it is showing honor to God when you do it. It's showing that you love God when you do it, but it's dealing with others. So that's important to God. It's been important. It's important enough to put in the Ten Commandments. Even that God put it, he put six that dealt with loving other people. Um. And four that dealt directly with loving him. So inter interesting. It's very important to God. So uh, let me flip over to New American Standard because I didn't read that. Uh, it uses the word chosen lady instead of the elect. What, what was the lady in? What did they say here? Oh, they use, same wording. Chosen lady. All right. This, one, this woman was chosen by God for a, an important purpose. He said right here, not only was he happy, he says happy in NLT, but I like this. It says he was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received a commandment to do from the Father. All right. Um, he says, not a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning to love one another. And let's keep going back. Let's go back to NLT. Uh, let me see. Love means doing what God has commanded us. And he has commanded us to love one another, just as you heard from the beginning. What did Jesus say? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I want you to write that in the comments. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So to love God is to keep the commands of God. Whether that deals with loving another, a fellow man, or it deals with love directly towards God. But it all, it, you know, affection expressed towards God is what I'm saying. But when you obey his commands, you're showing love. So continuing on, let me see. couple things here uh dealing with okay okay john's uh this is john's peculiar verse five referencing that this is john's peculiar emphasis in all his writings he uses the word love 117 times compared to only 174 times by all other writers of the New Testament. So John, which he wrote a lot of the New Testament, but oh, he wrote how many books? Technically five books. And two of these letters are basically chapter length letters. So um, he wrote, you know, because he did Revelation John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And he uses the word love 117 times. You take all the other New Testament writers, a total of 174. And that's a lot more writing than him. So his that's his emphasis. His emphasis was love. Um, continuing on, keeping the commandments of the New Testament is proof of genuine love. Why does it say, why, you know, in Dakes it always uses, uh, a lot of times he re he's referencing keeping the commands of the New Testament because it, a lot of people get confused and they'll go back through 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 like uh, the Levitical priesthood and the um, commands to the Jewish people in the old covenant and try to keep up with all of those. And, you know, those ceremonial aspects of those commands were done away with. And now we're moving into the spiritual aspects of those commands are still there. But there are specific things that were dealt with done away with i mean when it comes to the food in the new testament and the eating and the dress and things like that those are not carried out as part of the law anymore however we still keep the ten commandments and in fact jesus even put more emphasis on you need to make sure your heart's right you can you can hate in your heart you can uh and and that you can murder somebody in your heart excuse me through hate you can commit adultery in your heart through lust so jesus like up the ante and not didn't just focus on the action um whatever up the ante means but um that sounds i don't i have no idea where that what what that phrase would mean like out like what is the origin of that but let's just continue verse seven i say this because many deceivers have gone out into this world they deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Again, John was having to deal with this. I guess it was a, it was a thing happening where people would say, "Oh, Jesus didn't come. He wasn't the Son of God in physical form." Or either, you know, even to this day, you have uh, your traditional Jews that don't believe. Um, what what's that term? Why is that term slipping my mind? They don't believe in a that Jesus was the Messiah. They believe he was a good man. But he wasn't the Messiah, and they're still waiting on a Messiah. That's why the Antichrist will have uh, a great influence on a lot of Jewish people because they'll accept him as the Messiah and, um, and others. But continuing on, such a person is a deceiver and an Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God, but anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. Interesting. I want to see this in New American Standard. Look how it says it here. Um, It says, those who do, do not acknowledge in verse 7, Jesus Christ is as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Verse 8 says, watch yourselves. Write that in the comments. I must watch myself. I must watch myself. 
That's a keeping a watch over your life. The Bible says, guard your heart for out of it flow the issues of life. Uh, New, New Living Translation says, it determines the course of your life. Be sober, be vigilant, because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We must keep watch. We must stay uh, on guard that you do not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And if anyone, this is the next part here, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your house. And do not give him a greeting. All right, this is like, don't associate with this person. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. All right, so he he was saying, don't deal with these people that would teach something other than that. I mean, this will give you permission not to uh, answer the door for Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> I think it makes a it makes a strong doctrinal doctrinal case, strong biblical case for that. Let me stop. I mean, it kind of does, honestly. Um, but I want to look at this. It said in verse eight: "Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve." We must. I was just talking with someone about this. I won't uh, get into specific details, but we I was talking about how, you know, things have in the church world have changed for whatever reason. A lot of people have gotten away from, you know, I'd call it old school Pentecostal stuff, such as laying on of hands, uh, speaking in tongues, baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, fire field services. And they almost like, and here's the thing about, I understand if you're in a a denomination that does not participate in those things, that's fine. You've never done that. Why change anything now? You know what I'm saying? Like, don't, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about there are churches that have literally built their, their foundation on the move of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, uh, laying on of hands, being different in the sense that they believed what we what people call the full gospel, or it was a full gospel church, charismatic, Pentecostal, whatever you want to call it, kind of church that had, you know, a fire to it and had all those things. And then people, the churches have, they grew from that. Then all of a sudden they want to be cool or they want to be a trendy. So they've changed the way they preach. They preach like almost like it's a, you know, my pastor says it's a Ted, like a Ted talk, you know, um, and they, 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 it has no, it has no passion behind it. It's just like a nice little speech with that peaks your brain and people go, Hmm, yeah, that's good. Hmm, hmm, hmm. That's the kind of stuff they do, but nobody really leaves. Like there's no anointing in it. It's just like mental gym. Like it's tickling your brain. Like it's not even, it's not speaking to your spirit. It's just playing with your mind. And and it's people people have moved to that where it's like I want to dress cool, I want to be tame, I want to I don't want to scare anybody off. Almost like if the Holy Spirit and Jesus, like I don't want to scare any new people off from church, so we'll keep the Holy Spirit in a back room, as if the Holy Spirit and Jesus actually fight against each other, and that you know if we preach if we just preach Jesus and the gospel, uh, and we leave like the move of the Spirit out we'll get more people saved because if we have the move of the spirit, that'll scare people. Tickle me, Elmo preaching. <laughs> It'll scare people. Um, so they, they, they put the Holy Spirit, they save it for special nights, maybe prayer meeting, maybe a revival meeting, but definitely not on a Sunday morning where we have a lot of visitors. No, we might scare them away. But we understand that the Holy Spirit, first of all, there he works in unity with Jesus. No one comes to uh, faith without even the Holy Spirit drawing them in and convicting them. No one gets saved without the Holy Spirit. However, you and and people just want I just want they just want that little part of the Holy Spirit, and they don't want to open it up to everything the Spirit has the the gifts of the Spirit. I'm telling you, somebody gets out of a wheelchair, somebody gets healed, 
somebody uh, gets a, a word of knowledge, somebody gets a, um, a gives a prophetic word that comes true, people will turn to Christ. Like that, that is more evangelistic than um, that'll bring people in. That'll bring people into a church building. That'll change the world. But we can't, people hide that stuff and they forget. They want to change and get away from the foundational things that got the church to a certain level. You see churches all across, the, especially America. And that's, I'm not really familiar with, actually, you know, in a lot of these westernized countries, right? The modern countries that their whole platform was built on moves of the spirit passionate worship um and uh strong emphasis on the word strong emphasis on the spirit uh moving strong emphasis on the gifts of healing and faith and miracle signs and wonders tongues uh all those things build your whole platform on that your church grows because of that and then because we start bringing young people in who you know, sometimes they're handed a platform because of, of you know, seniority or um, nepotism. They're in the family or they just seem cool. So uh, we hired this guy, but he don't have the same vision. And he comes in and, and, and they try to tame everything down. And they forget the reason why you're standing on the platform you're standing on is because of some people that got on fire for God and let the spirit move with no restraints. Now... And people forget. So going back to this verse, it says, uh, "Be." It says in verse eight, "Watch out, so you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve." And I believe that speaks to a lot of things going on. We're losing. If we're not careful, we can lo- we can lose. I won't say we're all losing, but the, you see churches across America, America just. They've lost their backbone. They've lost their fire. They've lost their passion. Somebody was just telling me um, about a church, and they said, I would consider them a tame, and um, I, won't, I, won't, I won't embarrass it but because I love Baptists, but I'll just say it. It was an Assemblies of God church, and this gentleman that had been there told me that I would consider it a, like a, tame, a calm, he actually said a calm Baptist church. Now, I understand that's how Baptists do it. I'm not criticizing Baptists. But what I'm criticizing is the Assemblies of God who who were built on fire, which is like in most Assemblies of God's logo has a fire or a dove or something going on. They were built on the move of the Spirit and tongues and things like that and a passion for God. But I was told they were being compared to a calm Baptist church. You've lost what you what we were built on because you're scared. You've you've backed down. You've got away from the things that um, built your ministry, which is crazy. And it says, "Be diligent so that you receive your full reward." Now, let me see if there's any notes on that. Again, go, when it talked about the deceivers, let me go back to verse seven. It talks about an antichrist or a deceiver. There, uh, deceiving spirits and deceivers denied the incarnation of Christ. Today, they are denying they are denying the bodily, fleshly resurrection of Jesus as well as the incarnation. I mean, some churches teach that they deny these things. Uh, they, but without that, you're not a Christian church. Without the resurrection, write that in the comments. Without the the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you're not a Christian church. Without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you're not a Christian church. If you don't teach that, if you leave any of that out, you're not a Christian church. If you said he came and he taught and he was a good he was a good man, that's what the Muslims say. If you said he 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 um he died, but he didn't really truly rise again. That was just a you know a vision that the disciples saw, but it didn't happen. You're not a Christian church. If you said it's all it's it's not literal and it's all uh, you know aspects of it were figurative and pick word pictures. You're not a Christian church. This is the this is 
And, I, and you know, most people would tell you they believe this. You know, most people that say they're Christians, but there are churches out there and you'll see them. You got to get into what they believe. If they don't believe that, they're not Christian. So it says, Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, proving that it refers to his bodily resurrection and his coming to again to earth in the flesh. Write this. He was raised to life in the flesh and he's coming back in the flesh. A lot of people think Jesus, that they, they miss the return of Christ as like he's coming back as this, a spiritual being. Jesus is literally going to come back physically to the earth. And yes, when you read about him riding on the white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth and flames in his eyes, um, slaying the Antichrist and his armies. I mean, there's a spiritual power on that, but you need to understand He's coming back physically and he's going to reign on this earth in his glorified body for a thousand years. And then that'll be the millennium. And then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and we'll be with him for eternity. But he's physically coming back. Everybody needs to know in the flesh, Jesus will come back. Yes, it will be his glorified body, but he's physically coming back and not in a spirit realm. He's going to physically come back on this earth. People will see Jesus uh, in the flesh in, this, in, in that time period. So continuing on, he will come in the same human body that was resurrected and taken to heaven. And that, that is in reference in Zechariah, Acts, uh, Philippians, 1 Corinthians, and in John. So it's all through the Bible, right? This is not just a random statement somebody took and tried to create a doctrine on. It's all over the Bible. It says Christians are warned to meet the required conditions of blessing in order not to lose rewards. Now, there's rewards in heaven. And I have mentioned these before, but let me read you the scripture real quick. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll start with verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. I want to read this to you because... I think everybody thinks we get to heaven and we all get participation trophies for being on earth. But there's actually different rewards. Now, God is not a socialist. He's not distributing evenly to everybody once you get to heaven. He's actually got specific rewards based on what you do. Now, that's why it's another emphasis on why we should live to please God on this earth and uh, do his will and do what he's called us to do. Because if you don't, you, that's what you're being judged for as a Christian, not your sin. Because if you're living in sin, that's a different kind of judgment. But as a Christian, he pardoned us from our sin and we have, we'll be judged for what we do on this earth. Now, this is what Paul said in first Corinthians three, verse 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will, the, the day, talking about the day of the Lord, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. You know, you, they sing that song, Refiner. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. It's talking about being tried by fire is I want my, my works on this earth, my actions in pleasing you, the things I've accomplished and the things I've done, my life to be tested by fire and what comes out on the other side to be pure. So you can build your house with, with precious things, build your life on precious things, throat got so dry hold on guys give me a second (coughs) 
All right. I think we're back. <clears throat> you know what it is? It's because... Hold on. I was given a cake today, and I haven't had that much. Azúcar. Is that how you say sugar in Spanish? Thanks for praying for me, because I could have died. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I haven't had that much sugar in a long time. And for some reason, for me, if I'm if I'm eating like... I usually eat low carb. If I eat low carb and then I introduce sugar, heavy sugar, or you know, if you're if you're in uh if you're fasting for a long period of time, you actually enter into what they call ketosis, okay, which is people do the keto diet and I like to do the keto diet. But when you eat sugar, <laughs> Can't believe I walked off. I just didn't know if I was gonna be like pass out on camera. So I, I was thinking I could click another screen, but I didn't know if I had enough time to do that. Anyways, you eat a bunch of sugar, it will like dry. Like for me, sometimes it'll like get my th make my throat dry, and also like make my eyes dry. So that was a lot more sugar than I had had eaten in a while. So with that being said, <laughs> that's why I almost died. Okay, the rewards in heaven. You can build your life. Out of wood, hay, and stubble, that won't make it through the fire, the refiner's fire. You can build your life on precious stones, precious metals, gold, silver, precious stones. It will make it through the fire. And anyone's work which he has built, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. <laughs> but he himself will be saved. Yet so as through fire. So, okay, let me let me read you a couple things on that cuz it's important. Your works on this earth are compared to these materials. Again, everybody needs to hear this. That there was my wife is on here now. There was I almost died. I choked. You can rewind it, but I choked on my own dry spit, okay? I don't even know if spit can be dry. And I had to run out and get a little mini water. That's why people are laughing at me right now. Okay. All right. But we're talking about your works. Your reward. What are you doing? It's a little bit late. You're on a delay. She's giving me. I got. <laughs> the internet delay is so bad. I could have died. She would have been. <laughs> She came down here to save me. All right. Um, that's why y'all's comments are a little bit delayed. Anyways, man, I, okay, let's get to the serious stuff here. I can't. Um, your works on this earth are compared to these materials. Some become, and okay, what I was saying, your works don't save you. The Bible's clear about that. And people say this is uh, the way I'm preaching right now might be a works-based gospel. It's not a works-based gospel. The gospel is the, is the message of the saving grace of Jesus, and what he did on the cross, okay? That's the gospel. This is the New Testament believer's daily walk. This is what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about eternal, eternal rewards, all right? That's what I'm talking about. So... It's not, this is, you know, if, if you feel like I'm preaching a works-based teaching here, yes, this is talking about works. Your works are compared to these materials. Some become pure in the fire and others are completely burned up by fire. Fire will test every man's works. If his are gold, silver, and precious stones, they will endure the fire and he will receive a reward for his works. If they are wood, hay, and stubble, his works will be burned up Yet he himself will be saved from the loss of his soul. So it's like you're is you're not dying and going to hell, but your works you could you can make heaven. You can make heaven, and have and and have what you did for God on earth be burned away because it was against His will. It was worthless works. So I want to be in the in the center of the will of God. Write that in the comments. I want to be in the center. 
of God's perfect will. I want to be in the center of God's perfect will. Now, that was talking about for believers. Okay? And according, what will we be judged on? I'm gonna, let's see. I'm gonna, we'll stay on this for a minute because the, the, the other chapter is almost over. So, believers will be judged concerning doctrine. Believers will be judged concerning conduct to others. Carnal traits, like worldly traits, you'll be judged on that. You'll be judged for every word that you said. You'll be judged for things that affect others. Slander, quarrels, idle words, you know, gossiping, foolishness, dis dishonesty, broken promises, wrong dealings, cheating people. You'll be judged for those things. Sixth, you'll be judged for things that affect yourself, neglecting opportunities, talents wasted. Remember in the parable of the talents, that is a very big thing that he judged him based on the fact that he buried what he had and never used it. Um, loose living, lack of spirituality, and then things that affect God, refusal to walk in the light, disobedience, rejection, failure to cooperate and yield to the spirit. So it's saying you're going to go to heaven, but your works would, if they're not built on the right thing, they will be uh, burned away. So you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta understand. You can go, you can get to heaven on the bare minimum, or you can get to heaven with a lot of treasure stored in heaven for you for eternity. Um, what is this? This is interesting. Okay. A man will suffer loss if his works are burned or not suffer loss if they are not burned. He himself will be saved as if, if he is in Christ, if he's, if he's a Christian, right? If he's given his life to the Lord, regardless of what happens to his works. Okay. So this is what that is talking about. Interesting stuff. A, th a thing that not a lot of people teach on because they want to take the scripture from I believe, I don't remember if it's Ephesians or Galatians that talks about we've done nothing to earn salvation. This is not talking about earning salvation. As it tells you that these um, two examples of the one whose works was burned up and the ones whose works lasted through the fire, both made heaven. So they're talking about, it's, it's, consider, it's talking both to believers, but it's talking about what you do with your life. So very important. To understand that the reward, there is a reward in the end. And what did it say to do to receive that reward? It said, uh, be diligent that you receive your full reward. So stay, uh, stay watching over your life. Watch over the things that people have worked hard to achieve. I'm on verse eight. I've been on it for like 30 minutes. <laughs> And, but we were we were in a I, we flipped over to First Corinthians chapter three to check out what the Bible says about the heavenly rewards. So um, you got to work hard to keep the foundational things there. Don't stray off into new doctrine. Don't wander away from the teaching. You'll have no relationship with God. You get all outside of 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 the foundational teachings. You mess up your fellowship with God. Now let's let's go to the next screen here. Um, if anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home or give any kind of encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people become a partner in their evil works. So, um, yeah, I, I probably we lost about five minutes of this broadcast with a dry cough. Um, a note on verse nine, anyone who sins and does not remain in anyone who sins and does not remain in the truth does not have God. Anyone who does not sin and who remains in the truth have both the father and the son. This warns of the possibility of backsliding and losing rewards in verse eight, as well as losing God in Christ. So keeping a watch over your life, being diligent. Being careful with how you live. Those things matter. Uh, understand that there's an eternal reward that we need to 
uh, um, be diligent about receiving. Now, let's see here. If anyone poses as an apostle or Christian teacher, talking about verse 10 here, and does not teach the, tr the true doctrine of Christ, the incarnation, that means Jesus came in the flesh, the death, the burial, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, do not receive him or give him entertainment in your home. And then this is, this is what I was saying earlier. You missed a really good joke. I'm talking to my wife. This is, you know, biblical grounds potentially for ignoring Jehovah's Witnesses when they knock on your door. Don't, do not even bid him Godspeed. That's what it says in the King James Version. If you do, you are a partaker in his evil deeds and will be punished. Punish with him for the same sins. Uh, this is mostly talking about somebody coming in, uh, a false preacher, you allowing as, you know, he's talking to a church leader who was a woman, by the way. Fun fact for all the, the uh, women preacher slash church leader slash board member haters. Uh, John wrote a whole letter to a woman who was a church leader. Um, so, it said, uh, if you allow somebody to come into your meeting and preach a false gospel, they don't knock any, on the doors anymore or just stand on the, they just stand on the corner? Is that what you're saying? Um, they do still knock on doors around here. I've seen people riding around. Um, but it said if if someone comes in and preaches a false gospel and you give them you you know you treat them kindly <laughs> you're not supposed to treat those people kindly and and as a church leader you're not supposed to have them in there period don't invite them over don't spend no time with them don't support them kick them out in conclusion actually let's see what new american standard says real quick if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. Greeting for the you're the one who gives him a greeting, participates in his evil deeds. All right. Uh, let's read what it says here. 12 and 13. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made complete. You know, he uses that term a lot. They do stand in the corners now, yeah. They're getting, listen, even the, even the Jehovah's Witness are getting tame now. We, you know, the Pentecostals and the assemblies are getting tame. As I was ranting on about earlier. And even the Jehovah's Witnesses are getting tame. They can't even knock on doors no more. Maybe it was a COVID thing. I don't know. The children of your chosen sister greet you. So not only was this lady chosen, but the sister was chosen. And I guess the children were doing really good. Um, and uh, New American Standard uh, says basically the same thing. It says your joy will be complete. And uh, yeah, so it's a shorter COVID changed their ways. Yeah, COVID changed about <laughs> most churches' ways. I was My biggest thing that I got out of this, he was basically repeating a lot of the same things about loving one another watching out for deceivers. But one of the big things he said that caught my attention, and I spent a lot of time on it, but just a reminder, because it, it spoke to me, was in verse eight when he talks about, you know, keeping a watch over your life and work hard not to lose those things that they've worked so hard to establish, you know, that people in the past have. And he was a founder, he was an elder. So and it's, it's not about not, be, not being flexible and moving with, um, new things, new technology, um, new presentations of the, the gospel, um, you know, in different ways through uh, different methods. But it must be the unadulterated, unfiltered gospel. It's got to be the real deal. It's got to have the spirit behind it. It's got to have the anointing. It cannot just be a TED talk. It cannot just be a great media presentation 
that uh, was written by AI. It has to have the Holy Spirit on it. It has to have the anointing on it. And when you say, when you think those things might get a little scary and run people off, you know, that's what built your church. Why run from it? Why turn away from it? Why change now? Why jump off the foundation? So, you know, there's young young ministers coming up who want to be like the cool young ministers on TV. Um, and you know what? Sailor told me tonight, because Adam and Eve sinned, they had to leave and go to work. She said they should have worked harder at obeying God. Okay. All right, I was I was going on my rant. Young preachers, young ministers coming up that want to just be a you want to mimic Michael Todd, Stephen Furtick, some youth pastor you found. That's what you want to do. And you know I'm I don't know much about those ministries. I'm gonna be honest with you. I actually listen to more. I listen to some old school people. I listen to some. I listen to Firefield people. I listen to proven people. I listen to people that minister and not just give speeches. And I'm not saying that's what they do, but that's all I see on the internet. They don't, if they do ministry other than that, it's not on the internet. I'm not here to criticize, but if you get away from those things, we never minister. And I'm thinking about minister as in you allow the anointing to flow through and it's not a rehearsed thing that you wrote out a couple days um, you know, before you preached, but even like, I can tell you just preaching to teenagers, you can write something. If you're yielded to the Holy spirit, you can write some notes, but when you get in the room with the people and their spirits, you actually, you feel, sometimes you feel a completely different thing or you hit something. This is what I heard from Jonathan Shuttlesworth. Don't preach past the anointing. You might have seven awesome points but when you get to point four it really starts hitting and connecting with people don't go to point five and six and seven just preach point four out and uh minister people are ripe to minister and then you go into point five and then they start dwindling down you got to feel it you got to be able to sense it in your spirit so everything can't be rehearsed everything can't be written out weeks in advance even days in advance. I don't know if it if it, it don't it don't work that way. I'll have stuff written down, but when I get into a room and I feel people's I feel the presence of God and I sense people's spirits, it changes the message oftentimes. So that what does that have to do with second John verse eight? I don't know. I got on a rant. So my thing is don't get away from what what established the church. Don't get away from the book of Acts even. What did Peter, what happened on the, the, the day one of the church? Day one of the church was people got filled with the spirit. There was a mighty rushing wind. They started praying in other tongues. Okay, don't get away from that. It was noisy and loud and it shook things up and it attracted people. It attracted a crowd of thousands. And then Peter with no microphone steps up even when people were mocking him and saying people were drunk he steps up and he says he shouts to like 3000 people 3000 plus people so you know say I don't like preachers that get loud and shout okay you wouldn't have liked peter you probably wouldn't have liked jesus cuz if he was preaching to a thousand people he wasn't talking like a you know they make they make jesus on these tv shows and movies sound like he's you know, Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, he was talking, he had to talk loud. There were thousands of people. He had to project his voice. And my wife, who hates when, when preachers yell, get over it. Yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to Grace Scarlet right now. Get over that. Jesus, you, Jesus, you would have left Jesus' service because he was yelling. No, but uh, <laughs> day one of the church. Holy Spirit moved. It was loud. The preaching was loud. He preached scripture. He talked about the spirit being poured out. He talked about prophesying. He prophesied. He preached repentance and turning from your sin. 
They baptized like 3,000 people. That was a long day. A miracle happened where everybody heard their own language. Think about this. This is, there was, <laughs> there was ministry going on. And there was a move of the spirit that attracted people. The move attracts people. Then the ministry happened and people were, they were ripe to listen because something was going on that captured not just their mental attention. It did not attract their flesh, but it spoke past all that into their spirit. So that's the problem with most young preachers and young uh, and trendy people. They want to appeal to the flesh and appeal to the mind. And that's it. They don't want to appeal to the spirit. Because the spirit, when they start, you start going down that road, you can't program everything. You know, nothing wrong with doing a, a um, an event that appeals to the flesh in some sense of like, okay, we're going to do some food or we'll do something fun or we'll attract people in. Nothing wrong with those things. We'll do a giveaway. I don't think anything's wrong with that. But when you get into a, a just appealing to the mind given life principles and things like that. And you forgot, oh, let me throw a verse in there to make it seem like it's it's a Christian sermon. That's a problem. It needs to come from the word of God because the word of God divides all that between the soul and the spirit and the and the joint and marrow. It it it's a living and active two edged sword. So stay with the word, speak from your spirit, minister in the anointing. And we got to stay that way. We got to keep, we got to stay in that. Don't, don't shy away from it. Anyways, I love y'all. I want to just, I'll give you a preview about tomorrow's. I believe I'm going to do it at lunchtime. That's the plan. Last time I had to reschedule because some things came up, but you get into third, the third epistle of John and which we'll do tomorrow at 12. We're going to talk about greed in the church, and we're going to talk about a biblical view of prosperity and a biblical view of greed, and how sometimes, um, and actually, he deals with this guy named Diotrephes, who it was a greedy dude that was hoarding the money from the uh, the evangelists and ministers coming through. So. We'll, we'll uh, check that out. It's going to be interesting. So, um, anyways, let's close out in prayer. Uh, let me throw this up there because I haven't been promoting it. And my dad says, you need to promote those things. Okay. I've got shirts with a podcast logo. I've got some other shirts. i got hoodies. i got things like that. Um, you can support the podcast by doing that. I'm trying to upgrade stuff, uh, upgrade cameras, upgrade the set. Instead of it just being like a, like I'm being interrogated, you know, or something like that. Whatever you, you think this, this, uh, vibe is right now. But, um, <laughs> also you can just, if you want to give towards it, you can, or you can buy, you know, if you want to get a support by buying some of this merch, you can do that too. But with that being said, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time together. Lord, I pray you bless everyone watching today. Lord, I thank you that you've called them, you've equipped them, you've empowered them, Lord. I thank you that they're going to live this life out and, and live diligently before you. They're going to be keep a watch over their hearts. They're going to watch over their minds, watch over what they let allow into their life, and they will live holy and on fire for you. Then when they get to the end, Lord, we ask, Lord, let our life be a life that when we get to the end, when you test our lives by fire, that gold so nothing but gold silver and precious stones come out and we can we can answer uh boldly and assuredly that we did everything that that you called us to do in this life that we won't shrink back in shame but we'd be confident to know that we were good and faithful servants on this earth lord that is our desire we want to, we want to we want to be good and faithful servants with and and good and faithful stewards with what you've given us with this life that we have the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the time, the children, the spouses, the the relationships, everything we have, the the finances, everything in our possession, that we would steward it well, and and that at the end of our lives, 
you would look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We love you, Lord. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nice set of emojis there, Monica. Hands, fire, heart, regular fire, praying hands, white praying hands, tan heart hands. Amen. All right. Have an awesome day. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for watching. I'll see y'all tomorrow during lunch.